Good morning. Today's message is titled, Wits and Dilemma. Now we're going to look at the first 32 verses of Psalm 107 in connection with today's message. Incidentally, it was a missing line spacing that piqued my interest in examining this psalm in a fresh new light. Now, I'm not uh, sure about the layout of this psalm in your Bible, but in my Bible, I see the following five groupings with respect to the first 32 verses. And I do notice that there is a line separation between the groupings. Verses 1 through 3 are grouped together. Verses 4 through 9 are grouped together. Verses 10 through 16 are grouped together. Verses 17 through 22 are grouped together. And finally, verses 23 through 32 are grouped together. Now, my regular Bible was in my study, and so I was reading from the Bible which was in my bedroom. And this line spacing I had not observed earlier. And that's what got me to take a fresh look at this psalm and to study it with a renewed purpose. Now, incidentally, the Newberry Bible that my father uses also has a line spacing uh, which uh, we had not observed before. I do not know what to say if your Bible does not have the line spacing other than to say that you probably got robbed in broad daylight uh, of that line spacing. And that line spacing does make a lot of difference in how you look at the psalm. Maybe it's time for a refund. But having said that, let's go on and dig into the psalm. Now, we would understand this psalm a lot better if we understood the background of the psalm. To the best of my knowledge, this psalm is without a title and its human author is unknown. Now, the Holy Spirit is the true author of this psalm, as with the rest of the Bible. The occasion on which the psalm was composed was most likely on a return from the Babylonian captivity. With what I have stated in mind, let me paint the background in which this psalm was written. Now the chimes of God's great clock had struck, and the appointed hour in heaven had come. And at once God sets in motion the decree of Cyrus the Persian. Now free from the Babylonian captivity, the Jewish captives could go home. Their exile was over. The prophecy of Jeremiah had been fulfilled and the prayer of Daniel had been answered. Now one may wonder why the greatest world power on earth at that point of time had deliberately opened its hand and let the Jews go free. But we need to look no further than to understand that God's promises are sure and firm. Yea and Amen. God had acted and come down like David of old, and he had taken the lamb out of the paw of the lion and the maw of the bear. The majority of the Jews, many of them had been born in Babylon since the 70-year exile had begun. They simply yawned in the face of God. They preferred to stay on in Babylon rather than undertaking the rigorous journey which was a four-month march across a pitiless and a dreary desert. They had made the world and Babylon their home, and they were satisfied with the worldly prospects that Babylon offered. So like Demas in the New Testament, who had once been a fellow laborer with the Apostle Paul, yet we read that Demas forsook Paul when the going got tough. Like Demas, these Jews Having chosen the present evil world, they stayed on in Babylon. Now of the exiled Jews, only 42,360 people, along with 7,337 slaves and 200 singers, had chosen to return with Zerubbabel, while the vast majority stayed behind. So great was the Jewish backsliding that from the entire priestly tribe of Levi, only 74 Levites decided to return to the Promised Land. To those wondering where I got those dismal numbers, I got it from Ezra chapter 2. So the background under which this psalm was penned is steeped in, sp- in spiritual declension. 
material aggrandizement, disobedience to God's word, and a proclivity to sin. And this leads to the psalmist painting four pictures which are picturized in this psalm. To understand the Jewish return from exile, it is really important to understand that the return of the exiles and the rebuilding of Jerusalem was carried out in three phases or three waves. Now phase number one or wave number one happened under the leadership of Zerubbabel. It was during this period that the people of Israel had built a second temple. Zerubbabel, if you recall, was a prince of the house of David. He was the only person of royal blood to heed the mighty moving of the Holy Spirit of God. Zerubbabel was accompanied by a priest named Joshua. Now phase number two or wave number two happened 78 years later and it happened under the leadership of Ezra the scribe. And Ezra was instrumental in bringing about spiritual and religious reformation. Now wave number three happened about 13 years after wave number two had happened and it took place under the leadership of Nehemiah, the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah's focus was to repair the walls and gates of Jerusalem. This psalm is national in character, but it applies as much to the redeemed of the Lord as it does to the nation of Israel. This is very evident and very clear because we see that the opening verses addresses the redeemed of the Lord in the following way. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I had looked up uh, Charles Spurgeon's commentary on, on this psalm and I saw that Spurgeon in writing about this psalm stated that the construction of this psalm is highly poetical and merely a composition of it would be that it would be very difficult to find a similar composition and of equivalent value and equivalent character or to find its equal compere among human productions. Now verses 1 through 32 of Psalm 107 represents the first section of this psalm. Now the Lord will bless to us this first section of this wonderful 107th psalm. In this first section of the psalm, we have specifically trials listed. In fact, there are four trials listed. And you'll find that these trials listed brings forth supplication. And eventually that supplication leads to praise for, pra for answered prayer. In this psalm, we see repeatedly trials and troubles, supplication for deliverance, and finally praise for the deliverance granted. God knows that we as believers must have a meaningful prayer life or our spiritual lives will begin to degenerate. Our spiritual lives will begin to dry up and become totally spiritually barren. Now each of us cause God too much for him to sit by inactive, idle and watch our spiritual lives decline. So God intervenes in our lives to produce prayer which he knows will spark up the spiritual energy and vitality that we seem to lose when we do not pray. So if we could write over this psalm one single principle, I think it would be this. If we will not pray, then God will make us to pray. That seems to be the lesson that we learn in Psalm 107. Now let's observe the verses first 1 through 3. And it goes this way. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Now in these introductory three verses, the psalmist states that the Lord deserves our praise because of what he has done for us. The opening three verses have been dedicated to the redeemed who have been gathered from captivity. You see, the Jews had been redeemed from the clutches of Babylonian captivity without a single arrow being fired by them. This morning, 
how much more our hearts should rejoice that we, the redeemed of the Lord, have been delivered from the clutches of an enemy far greater and fiercer than any human foe. The lesson I understood from these verses we read is that a people redeemed and delivered by the Lord ought to be a thankful, praying, and a praising people. Prayer, if you ask me, of course, is based on three great principles. First of all, there must be a God to hear the prayer. Otherwise, the prayer is futile. And so we find that the psalm opens with this emphatic exclamation in verse 1. The Lord, He is. Now many of us know God personally and we have known His blessings in all our lives. But this is the great essential if our prayer life is to be, to be spiritually vibrant. The existence of God. We read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I suppose all of us at some point in our Christian life, we have heard the wicked whisperings of the devil when we get down to pray. And the devil will suggest in our ears that our prayer is futile and that prayer is a futile exercise and that our voices are not heard above the ceiling. And the devil would drop these doubts and fears into our minds. But the scripture clearly makes it very plain that the Lord, He is. So that is the first, that is the first essential. That there must be a God to hear the prayer. Otherwise, prayer is useless. Secondly, there must be a God who is inclined to hear that prayer. Thirdly, this God not only must be inclined to hear the prayer, but he must be also be inclined to do good to his creatures. So the psalmist tells us, O oh, gives thanks unto the Lord, for he is, and he is good. This expression of God's goodness finds its mark in the form of answered prayer. And we now find in the rest of the psalm where we have this phrase repeated over and over again. Then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Now in this section of the psalm, we find four distinct situations where prayer is exercised. The four situations are all unique and they are quite different from each other. In each situation, the, prayer, the person is in a place of comfort and then they end up in a place of misery and then they cry out unto the Lord. So you see a tremendous contrast between a place of comfort to a place of misery. I suppose if Charles Dickens were asked to portray these contrasting fo fortunes which are presented in the psalm, then he would probably utter those immortal lines that he penned long, long ago. It was the best of times, yet it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, yet it is the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, yet it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, Yet it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. Yet it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. Yet we had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven. And yet we were all going directly the other way. In this psalm, the psalmist takes out his precious canvas and he paints four vivid, unforgettable pictures. You will notice that each of these pictures has four distinct parts and you will notice that these parts are very much common to each other. Firstly, in each picture there is a trouble expressed. The only difference between the pictures is that, tr that the trouble in each picture is different. But the common element or the common theme is trouble. Secondly, there is an extremity reached and the individual reaches their wits end. 
Thirdly, when this individual or these individuals reaches their wits end, then there is a cry for help because of their desperate need. And fourthly, there is the answer from God that comes just in the nick of time. In each of these pictures, there is only one of two causes for the problems. The first cause is that God has either caused or permitted the circumstance in the life of the individual to draw the individual unto himself. The alternate cause being that the circumstance has been the result of sinfulness on the part of the individual. In each of these pictures, God's desire is exactly the same. He wants to elicit from the heart of his people, his creatures, the word of praise unto himself. And in each case, a distinctly different realm of the individual has been affected. When you look at these four pictures, you will find that in the first picture, it is the soul which is impacted. In the second picture, it is the heart which has been impacted. In the third picture, it is the body which has been impacted. And in the last picture, it is the mind which has been impacted. The soul, the heart, the body and the mind. Those four realms, if you think about it, cover the entirety of human realms from where we experience trouble. So that no matter which area of our life is impacted, we clearly see that there is this possibility of a relief because of God's ability to meet that need in response to our cry and in response to our prayer for help. So let us go ahead and look at these four pictures. In picture number one, you will see that in verses four through nine, as I stated earlier, the realm affected is the soul. The picture painted by the psalmist on his canvas is that of a person lost in the desert. Let's look at verses four through nine and it goes this way. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, their soul, remember the realm affected is the soul, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. So here the psalmist describes Israel's desperate condition. The psalmist is then led by the Holy Spirit to show that this person in this psalm then makes a dismal confession. He then comes to a dramatic conclusion. And then he ends it with a determined conviction. As stated before, I want to look at this psalm not from a historical perspective or a prophetic setting, but more perhaps with respect to the needs of many of us in the congregation this morning. Here, the people, they are seen as weary travelers. Weary travelers who are wandering aimlessly and are now needing a dependable guide. You see, these people had wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They had found no city to dwell in. They were hungry and thirsty, and their soul fainted in them. My friend, I want to tell you this morning that such is life when it is out of touch with God. Here we have a people who had lost their pilgrim character. Now, if you think about it, our pilgrim is different when compared to a wanderer. A wanderer doesn't know where he is going. A wanderer has no certain goals. While, if you think about it, a pilgrim has a clear direction and a clear destiny. The people in this first picture 
had lost their sense of pilgrim character and they had lost their vision of where they were going. This was their real problem. Their troubles specifically is outflined in a five-fold manner in these verses. Firstly, their problem was they were out of the way. It is described as a desert way, a trackless waste. They wandered in the wilderness. It was a way where there were no signposts, where they wandered without any sign of a sense of direction. They had no guide to guide them. So their second problem was this. They had no guide to guide them. No signposts. Their third problem was it was a solitary way. So they were utterly lonely on this path. Their fourth problem was that it was a way where they found no settlements. They found no city to dwell in. Where they could rest and take comfort. And their final problem was that they were hungry and they were thirsty. It was a way in which they found no supplies to satisfy their hunger. It was a way where their soul fainted because of the unquenchable thirst. That, my friend, is a perfect description of what life will be like for those out of the will of God. So here is the trouble which these people found themselves in. They had no dependable guide. As a result, they wandered. You see, when the child of God loses his sense of destiny, when he loses his sense of vision of where he is going, it is inevitable then that he will start to wander. When a believer, because of encroaching materialism, begins to wander in this maze of earthly values, they will often find themselves in a withering wilderness. And that will produce a great deal of distress and discouragement in their lives. The withering wilderness causes believers to get out of fellowship with those who are going on for the Lord. And so what happens is spiritual loneliness results. And spiritual loneliness is a real heartache that many Christians find themselves in today. An unsettled spirit, a lack of tranquility, Agitation and unrest afflicts the soul when you become a wanderer instead of a pilgrim. The wanderer finds that in the wilderness there is very little to satisfy or nourish his soul, very little to meet the deep hungers. This world, this world, this old world is in fact well pictured in the Bible as a wilderness. In fact, David calls it a dry and thirsty land. This was the trouble these people found themselves in. They had become occupied with a present thing. They had become occupied with the transient and with the passing. They found themselves to be in the wilderness, lonely. They are unsettled, hungry and thirsty. And this produced a great deal of anxiety for them. And in this real extremity, they found that their soul fainted in them. In their inward man, their souls fainted in them. In this extremity, they would soon discover that there are pains that no medication can cure. That there are hungers that no bread can satisfy. That there are thirsts that no amount of water can slake. The hungers of the soul, the thirsts of the soul, and the longings of the soul can only be satisfied by the divine provision that God himself can provide. In all their wanderings in this wilderness, having lost a sense of the city to which they were going and finding no satisfaction in any habitation down here, they realized what had gone wrong in their lives. What had gone wrong was that they had stopped praying. Their prayer, li their prayer life had diminished. Their lines of communication with the eternal God had been broken. They had been living in their own strength. And they, have, they had been trying to go it all by themselves, all alone. Maybe I'm speaking to someone today whose prayer life has diminished greatly. And someone who has been going it alone. And you now find that leanness and barrenness has entered and afflicted your soul. 
doing it all in your strength or on your own simply will not work. You know the Christian is not built like a motor car that they can pull themselves up on Sunday morning in a church, fill up their spiritual gas tank and then go on till next Sunday morning. That's not how the spiritual life works. I would rather say that the spiritual life is like the electric train. So long as we are in touch with that source of power, that engine will keep chugging along. But as soon as that trolley wire has been separated, as soon as we break contact with the source of power, very soon the engine will grind to a standstill. And this is what they were finding out that when they had come to this discovery, then it then it is when they had come to this discovery, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. That was the case in all four pictures, if you look at it. We see the same exact words repeated again and again and again. Then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. You see, not till they were in their extremities did they pray. But the mercy is that they prayed at least at that point of time. And they prayed in the right manner with a cry. And they prayed to the right person, even to the Lord himself. Even to the Lord himself. So what was the right thing they did? In their trouble, they cried unto the Lord. That was the right thing they did. What was the answer? The Lord delivered them out of their distress. How did God do it? Well, first of all, by giving them the assurance of his personal interest. The verse says that he led them forth. It was not an angel or some other servant of God. But it is directly God himself. So here it says, but the Lord himself intervened on their behalf to show them that he had a personal interest in their case. Now, I do not know how it is with you, but I think this is a true statement when I state that there have been times when we have all wandered away from the Lord. It is the mercy of the Lord toward us that the Lord has not left us to our wanderings. And he shows us that he cares profoundly about us. What a mercy that he intervenes in our lives. And he brings us back into the right way by giving us the assurance of his own personal interest in us. Thank God he does that in our lives. May I underscore that today, in case there is one Christian here, and maybe the devil has been giving you a real hard time, and telling you that you have failed the Lord. The devil will try to impress upon you that the Lord doesn't love you as much as he once upon a time did. That, he, or that the Lord doesn't love you as much as he or care for you as much as he cared for you once upon a time. The devil may try to tell you that he doesn't love you as much as the missionaries or how much God loves the preachers or the elders of the church or the pastor of the church, that you are just an outlier. I want to assure you this morning that such a thing is a horrendous lie out of the pit itself. We are better off living, leaving that in the gutter from where we picked it up. Because the love of God, as tainted in the Bible, is changeless. You see, it does not come and go. The love of God is ceaseless. And the love of God is causeless. And thank God that his love for us never changes in spite of our changing love for him. Because his love is without dissimulation. He loves us with all his love. Constantly he loves us because he is a changeless God. His love is always without dissimulation. That lovely old hymn that we sing is still true today as it was when it was written by the hymn writer. It goes this way, though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me whenever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when 
I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Indeed, Jesus loves even you and me today. So we find that God gave them the assurance of his own personal interest in their lives. He led them himself. He also gave them the direction of his perfect will. He didn't leave them anymore to their own wanderings or to their own intelligence or to their own wisdom. Rather we read that he led them forth by the right way. He knew where the right way was. And so what he did was he brought them back unto the right way. He renewed their vision. And we read that he lifted up their eyes from the wilderness and gave them that renewed vision to the place to which they were going. This morning I want to assure you my friend that he that is God gives his very best to those who leave their choice with him. Let me repeat that again. God gives his very best to those who leave their choice with him. If I had to summarize what we learn from these verses, then I suppose the principle painted and taught in this picture is found perfectly in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6 when it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now picture number two, we'll go to picture number two. That brings to an end to picture number two, picture number one. Let's go on to picture number two. Picture number two is found in verses 10 through 16. Here, as I had stated earlier, the realm affected is the heart. The picture painted by the psalmist on his precious ca canvas is that of a person locked in a dungeon. <coughs> Excuse me. Verses 10 through 16 goes this way. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart they fell down and there was none to help. And then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he had broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Once again, we find the same four characteristics. You have a desperate condition. You have a dismal confession. You have a dramatic conclusion. And then finally, you have a determined conviction. Here in this picture, the people are seen as discouraged captives who are in need of a mighty deliverer. You see, the people in this picture were in trouble. And why were they in trouble? Because they themselves had rebelled against the words of God. That was their problem. Once again, like in the previous picture, the trouble of this category of people are specifically outlined in a fivefold manner in these verses. Firstly, you find that darkness enveloped them. Secondly, Death lurked in the shadows waiting to consume them. Thirdly, dominion of sin shackled them. Fourthly, depression overwhelmed them. And finally, desertion characterized them. That, if you think about, is a very dull and discouraging picture, isn't it? I suppose if you could just write one word to summarize their trouble, it probably would be that it is down under. 
You see, rebellion against the words of God was the cause of their particular trouble. Now under trouble, their extremity was that their heart was burdened. It was a pain of their heart. The solution to their problem was to recognize that all of their trouble was the direct result of rebelling against the word of the Lord. Disobedience to God's word leads to darkness. Now, does a Christian ever get into darkness due to disobedience or due to God's permissive will in their life? Sure, he does. There are times when the believer gets into the thick darkness. Now, most of us has be, have been there at some point of time in our lives where we have been in the thick darkness. You open the book and you look for that well-known promises and somehow they don't seem to shine as they once upon a time did. You open up the daily bread or the streams in the valley or the streams in the desert or some other daily devotional which you follow regularly and it doesn't seem at all to relate to anything which is going on in your life at that point of time. Some dear brother comes along to visit you and you hope that he is going to be the Lord's messenger to give you that shaft of light. Some hope to ease your heartache. And you find that all he comes and does is he talks about Roger Federer versus Rafael Nadal, who is the greatest of all time. He has a very good discussion on that topic and then he goes. And you are still sunk in misery and still in the dark. Now it may be because of disobedience in our lives that this has happened because the Lord will use these means to convict us of our need for him. But remember this, that the darkness never excludes God. Even if you take nothing from this message today, I want you to take that one point away, that the darkness never excludes God. Now the enemy would say to your heart that because it is dark, God has left you and abandoned you. You may even be reminded of that scripture verse that states that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You see, the devil knows how to quote the scriptures, especially when you are down in the dumps. The Bible also says in Psalm 139 that the darkness and the light are both alike unto him. Now I can assure you personally, I went through a stage in my life where I was losing eyesight and I was practically 90% blind in one eye and 50% blind in the other eye. And I was going through a very rough stage in my life and all I saw was physical darkness. And that led to depression and eventually spiritual darkness set in. I remember feeling the walls closing in on me and I was in deep agony and sorrow. And in my darkness, I had equated the darkness with the absence of God in my life. In my despair, I remember I cried out unto the Lord. And then I remembered and I was reminded of that experience in Moses' life when Moses was asked to go up into the mountain. The word of God in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 21 says, Moses drew nigh unto the thick darkness where God was. What was that again? Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was was. You see, in my extremity, I had forgotten that God was in the midst of the thick darkness and that he had promised me his assured presence with me every step of the way. Sure enough, I can testify to you today that God uh, has brought me out of the darkness. He responded to my cry and he delivered me miraculously. Fellow believer, I want to assure you today that the darkness never excludes the presence of God. Rather, the darkness seen in picture number two was sent into the life of the believer so that the darkness envelops the soul because God intends us to feel our disobedience and turn back again to him. As believers, we need to remember that we are the children of the light and we are asked specifically to not to walk in the darkness. We learn in Ephesians 
the problem of walking in the darkness. And now we are told to behave relative to those who are the children of the night. We are asked to behave in a totally different fashion from those who are the children of the night. In this picture, we see them to be captives. These are captives needing to be delivered by one mightier than they. In their extremity, their heart was burdened. Then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble. Verse 14 specifically says, He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. You see, we see that God had met their need and brought them into the light. He brought them out of the darkness. He gave them life out of the shadow of death. He gave them liberty. Why? Because, well, God broke their bands in sunder. That's what it says. So he gave them liberty. The very things they needed, God provided. The very moment they recognized their true condition, and then they cried out unto the Lord in their desperate need, we find that God answered them. And by this God proved that they were not deserted at all. They thought that there were none to help them and that they were deserted. But all along God was standing by their side. And all the time he was simply waiting on them to cry out to him. Sometimes we think we need to pray long extended prayers. But the truth of the matter is the most effective prayers are simple, short, heartfelt prayers. Prayers prayed in holy desperation. If you don't believe me, look it up in Matthew chapter 14. You will find that Peter walks out of the boat and for a moment it was a great victory of faith that he was walking on the water. And then he takes his eyes off the Lord and the very next thing you see is that he is looking at the boisterous wave. And when he saw the boisterous wave, we read that Peter started to sink. In his desperation, Peter did not have the time to pray a 30-minute prayer. He had only time to cry out a simple three-word prayer. Lord, save me. That's all it took. If Peter had prayed a 30-minute prayer, he would have been at the bottom of the lake. But thank God, that simple three-word prayer is all it took and the Lord saved him. Fellow believer, when our heart is affected and all hope seems gone from view, we have a God who hears and answers prayers. And may we never forget those unforgettable words from this psalm. He broke the, great, the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Thank God we have a God who can open prison doors and bind up the wounds of the heart. This brings to an end to this message or part one of this message. Part two of this message will be, which will look at pictures three and four will be given as a separate message. Thank you and God bless you.